Hello, and thanks for joining us on Facebook Live and here at the Newsfeed Cafe in the WGBH studios. My name's Craig Lamont, and I'm a reporter, an environmental reporter at WGBH. And uh, today we have a fascinating discussion, I hope, uh, about a very important issue in the Boston area. Uh, we have a lot of highways here in the Boston area, and we got a lot of planes coming in and out of the Logan Airport. And all of those planes and cars are creating air pollution. Uh, and we're here to talk about that today. Uh, in in particular, they're releasing a kind of pollution, these little tiny particles that we're, a lot of us are breathing in. And there is uh, a number of universities in the Boston area that have been studying this kind of pollution. And we've just done a three-part series on the subject at WGBH News. You can find it online at WGBHnews.org. And I'm joined today, I'm so glad to be joined today by three of the scientists who are featured in that series uh, who are going to talk to us a little bit about the issue and what we need to know about this kind of air pollution in our area. So joining me first, John Durant on my right here is Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Also, Nalakshi Hutta, also PhD, Research Ass Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Ge Engineering, also at Tufts. And Scott Hersey, who uh, is a PhD, Assistant Professor of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at the Olin College of Engineering. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. So I want to just start uh, uh, to, by introducing what this issue is. What is particulate matter air pollution? Where does it come from? How does it form? Um, Scott, can you start? To explain this to us. What are we talking about here? Yeah, so particulate matter pollution is basically just tiny little particles that are suspended in the air. Uh, they can be solid, they can be aqueous phase, but they're, they're tiny little particles. Uh, they are regulated, they're widely considered the most dangerous for human health. And over the years we have, uh, through epidemiology research, have understood that the smallest particles are the most dangerous ones. So a lot of your stories focused on ultrafine particles, which is the smallest subset of particles uh, that are smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter. Okay. Well, actually, can you talk a little bit more about how these things are formed? Like, wh wh where are they coming from? What are, what are the, the main sources? Well, they range from natural sources to anthropogenic. But the story mostly focused on ultrafine particles, which originate from fuel combustion byproducts. So a lot of them, they nucleate, the gas phase nucleates and forms little particles, little like aqueous droplets, as he explained. These little tiny, tiny, I mean, tiny. these are really, really small. Ultrafine particles, they are smaller than the cells in our body. Yeah. They're about one, one one thousandth the diameter of a human hair. One yeah. one thousandth of the diameter, okay. Yeah, so in there and smaller. And, and John, why are we so interested in these particular kind of this particular kind of air pollution? What's the health impact of it? The the really small ones can get into your bloodstream really fast. They get into your lungs and they just diffuse across the alveoli into your bloodstream and they get widely distributed throughout the body. And the scientists are just catching up to the reality of that exposure. And so we're just understanding now that they have a, an impact on on heart rate. They have an impact on 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 um, markers of inflammation, which can lead to more chronic diseases like. Uh, cardiovascular, um, uh, well, well um, I increased uh, risk for cardiovascular impacts. I want to use my, my language carefully here. Mm -hmm. But so the science is just catching up to what um, we're observing in the environment that we're exposed to these um, ultrafine particles and we're, we're finding them in the body. We're finding that there are measures of health impact and then the long term implications of that are just being um, un discovered. So with the larger particles, um, which I believe, you know, PM 2.5, right, is what we, we hear PM, PM 2.5, it's 2.5 microns, and do I have, right? Yeah. Um, but the smaller ones, the ultrafines, um, are uh, kind of nastier in that they get right into the bloodstream. Do I have this right, that, that the larger particles, maybe they, the, you know, when I think about air pollution, I think about breathing this stuff in, and it's going to get stuck in my lungs, and I'm going to have lung problems, breathing problems. Um, but with the ultrafines, it's not getting stuck. It's it's going right. It continuing into the bloodstream. Is that right? That's correct. And they get widely distributed throughout the body. And and some that could go straight into your brain by breathing in through your nose. Is this new? I mean, you've been working on this. You've all been working on this for some time. But it feels like this is pretty new science and a new understanding of the dangers of this. We're not hearing a lot about ultrafine particles. Scott, would you say that's? I mean, or is this? Yeah, it's not part of the uh, sort of general understanding of air pollution uh, with the general public. I mean, uh, if, uh, you talk with a lot of people about air pollution. A lot of folks are familiar with terms like PM10 or PM2.5 or particulate matter. Ultrafine particles, that's a, that's a new phrase for a lot of people. And 
part of the issue is that these particles are invisible. They're so small that they don't interact with light. Uh, you can't smell them. Uh, you can't taste them, and so they're, they are really this invisible problem. Uh, We've only had the technology to measure them for like the last 20 years. Yeah, right? and it's an expensive measurement. Yeah. Uh, so to, to measure these things will require an instrument of at least $20,000. Yeah. So uh, you, can't, you can't have one of those in your house. And I think it's an, inter an interesting time to be talking about this. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are probably aware of uh, some of the, the changes that have been happening uh, nationally in terms of air pollution and specifically car air pollution. Um, and I think it's important to clarify that the, the move uh, just last week to, uh, to, to not allow California, to revoke California's ability to regulate its own air pollution does not include what we're talking about here. Uh, you know, the, the move by the Trump administration related to air pollution and the California standard, which is a more strict standard than a, the national standard, is dealing with greenhouse gases. Th th uh, is, uh, it's my understanding that we're not talking about particulate air pollution at all in, in those new regulations. Do I have that right? Well, the, so, so the state of California has an exemption to the Clean Air Act. Right. They asked for an exemption, which basically wasn't to get out of the Clean Air Act. It was so they could have something stricter. Right. Um, there are groups within the EPA that are tasked with paying attention to epidemiology research, civil and environmental engineering research to tighten things like particulate matter standards. Uh, the group that was required to do that under the EPA was disbanded in November under Scott Pruitt's administration. And by saying that California is no longer exempt, uh, it prevents California from doing things like having their own regulation for UFPs, because UFPs are unregulated right now. Uh, we have mass-based standards for particulate matter, uh, and basically the way that that's measured is what's the total mass of particles smaller than some size cut, and right now those size cuts are 10 microns and two and a half microns. Ultrafine particles comprise the, the largest number of particles but a comparatively small mass of the particles. So right, so this is an important point, is that because they're so tiny, because the measurement that we're, we're regulating is based on mass, these ones are so tiny, they don't even really factor into it at all. Right? Do I have, yeah. So that's that's correct. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Okay. They're technically part of it, but they're so small that they, they barely show up yeah. in the mass. Yeah. No, actually, with the existing regulations on PM 2.5, can you, I mean, how, how is that actually, is that making a difference, the, the regulations and, and the fact that the ultrafines are not regulated? Uh, does that, you know, what does that mean for us in terms of public health? So I don't really see PM 2.5 and UFP in the same light. To me, ultrafine particles are, the mar are much better marker of fuel combustion based emissions or traffic emissions. And actually that's why our research focuses on them so much because we can really trace what's going on with these. Mm -hmm. Cars do emit some PM 2.5, but we don't see the gradients that we see near highways with PM 2.5 that we see with ultrafine particles. Right. So if you're really interested in addressing the health effects of highway pollution, then we are looking at a different mix of pollutants than looking at the overall big picture, regional picture, that EPA or regulatory agencies are tasked with, wherein they're looking at air pollution at a much wider level. Which is exactly what we're not doing now, <laughs> right? We're trying to push the science forward towards more local. Yeah, okay. Addressing smaller spatial scales. So I, I want to talk about the human exposure to this. We're seeing this kind of pollution, the ultrafine particles in particular, along highways, right? Uh, John, you and I, for the series, drove around in, in a, a mobile air um, monitoring unit. Uh, can you, first of all, describe what that is and how you measure this kind of pollution? Sure, so we have an electric-powered car, um, which we've um, taken out the back seat, put the, put the um, way back down, and um, instrumented up with um, a variety of different um, gas and particle, particle monitoring devices that allow us to measure um, a suite of pollutants in, in real time, um, so we can we can pretty much drive it anywhere there are roads. And uh, my research is, is has focused on characterizing uh, pollution levels on a variety of different roadways, including highways and arterial roads and residential roads in urban areas. And what have you found about where these particles are in relation to highways and communities? So just to 
be clear, these, these particles are, are everywhere. So they're, they're in the room right now, but they're at relatively low levels. Okay. So a couple thousand particles per cubic centimeter of air. But okay. if I live next door to a highway... It could be um, 25 times higher than that. Yeah. Right. So up to, up to around 50,000 particles per cubic centimeter of air. If you're on the highway driving with your windows open, that's what you're breathing. And, but and, and, and not just if you're on the highway driving, but if you uh, live next to a highway, uh, right up against a highway, or if you go to school, say, next to a highway, what kind of exposure are you experiencing? You're getting exposures that are as high as you'd get on, on the highway, depending on how close you are. So, so, so housing, schools, workplaces that are abut highways are getting that kind of exposures. And there are a lot of homes and schools and businesses yep built along the highways here in Massachusetts, aren't there? Right. There's a lot of inexpensive real estate there. Yeah. Becoming very attractive for developers to develop there. And, and in fact, actually, uh, not just the new development, but there's a lot of existing communities along these highways. And, in fact, what have we learned about what communities uh, are uh, disproportionately affected by this kind of pollution? And, and yeah, so the, uh, you know, when it comes to, to air pollution, there there's uh, there have been recent studies that have indicated that uh, people of color are experience a, a larger, uh, a disproportionate impact of, of air pollution, uh, and are responsible for creating a disproportionately small amount of it. Uh, yeah. So you know, low income communities of color tend to experience a lot more of the exposure to ultrafine particles and other pollutants, uh, and that's a it's a common theme in environmental justice. And I think it seems like there's two reasons for that. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's one reason, which is that a lot of these communities are closer to highways. There's two reasons for that, right? One is that it is, as you said, uh, less expensive uh, to, to live near the highways, but also there's a legacy in this state and elsewhere of building highways through low-income communities, right? Exactly. And that's happened in, in, in Somerville and Arlington, other, other places. Uh, not that Arlington is lo low income, but um, when they put in um, I, I 93, they divided um, you know, Somerville in half pretty much, um, or at least carved off a, a significant fraction of it. Now um, the Ten Hills neighborhood is, is, is um, truncated from the rest of Somerville, and they have, because they're downwind for most of the year of the highway, they get much higher concentrations of, right. of, of highway emissions than does the rest of Somerville. So. I want to ask about how close to the highway we see these high levels of uh, of ultrafines. Now, actually, can you can you talk to him? But it, it, it's not consistent, right? Is there's there's a there's a, an area of concern. I think the first research on this was done in the early 90s, but then um, it didn't get as much traction. But in 2000s, um, some research was done in Los Angeles by a few of my co-authors and. Uh, the rule of thumb is that you get about a tenfold reduction in somewhere around 250 to 400 meters, but it depends on what the kind of wind uh, situation you've got going. Mm -hmm. If the wind's stronger, you'd get a faster reduction or faster dilution. Sure. Uh, then it also depends on the season, which plays into the meteorology. But is that because of the temperature? Uh, temperature and the overall convection that we've got going, which helps with dilution of the particles okay. as you move further and further away from the highways. But rule of thumb, like between 250 to 400 meters, you're pretty much down to what is the urban background level, but then urban background differs from place to place. Sure. So but if, if, you're, is, if you're right next to the highway, you're going to have a, essentially a tenfold increase in this, this level of, of, of uh, ultrafine. Yes, going down, like right next to the highway, tenfold, and then further exponentially decreasing down to background by 250 or 400. Okay. Um, and exponential is um, the key there. So the closer you are, it doesn't just lini linearly increase. Right. It's a manifold increase. Okay. Um, so... What? But there's some subtlety there too that yeah. is sort of very interesting, which makes this research so fascinating. Is um, depending on the wind conditions and also atmospheric stability, so the ability of air masses to mix vertically, you can get much different um, concentration profiles. And um, what we've observed is that when the wind is from, you know, has a westerly component to it. So in the wintertime in Boston is largely west northwest winds. Mm -hmm. in summertime it's southwest winds. And so if you're living on the east side of the highway, you're going to get much higher levels all year long, except in a nor'easter, when the wind's coming from the east and blowing the particles and other pollution to the west. Right. Then, um, in the early morning hours, when you have really um, high stability, 
that is you warm air above, cold air below because the sun's rising up, warming the upper air first before it's um, warming air at the ground level. You can actually have really stable air below, so it gets pollutants get trapped there. So mm. when everybody, get, everybody gets on the highway and starts driving first thing in the morning, uh, you can get really high pollution levels because the pollution doesn't doesn't uh, mix with overlying air until the sun comes up higher in the sky and everything kind of warms up. Okay. So if you're living close to the highway, you can get some of your, your highest exposures early in the morning when the air is really stable. And some of the work from, from Los Angeles has shown that that really stable air can get pushed way downwind. So this 250 turns into like 2,000 meters downwind right. under, under certain conditions. You know, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it, it's important to understand that this is not a constant, right? That this is changing based on the time it's of day, very based very on the season, based on the weather. Um, but the people in these communities don't know that. They don't necessarily know when is a good time, when is a bad time. And, and I, I know, Scott, this, y you've basically been trying to help people be informed about the uh, the levels of this kind of pollution in their own communities. Yeah, so I mean, our, our paradigm for air quality monitoring is, is broken. It, it costs way too much to make these measurements. And as a result, you know, if, you've, if the EPA has to set up a monitoring station that costs $500,000, you're not going to have very many of them. Uh, there have been recent developments with low-cost sensors that have uh, basically developed high-fidelity measurements with a lower cost box. It takes a lot of uh, sophisticated data analysis to actually get a, a number that you can trust, and that's stuff that we're actively working on. But uh, if you're deploying sensors that cost a few thousand dollars instead of a few hundred thousand dollars, then you can put a lot more of them out. So. Right now, uh, you know, EPA monitoring sites don't provide exposure relevant data because, uh, as these guys are saying, if you if you're 250 meters away from that monitoring station, if it's 250 meters away from the road, you're going to have vastly different exposures indicated by those measurements. So, so you're trying to get these kind of monitors out into the community. Yeah, so we uh, have established a community-owned network of air quality monitors in East Boston. Uh, and the, the goal of that is to have better spatial resolution in the measurements uh, and to provide the data directly to residents in an actionable way uh, so that they can basically look at data on a cell phone app and say, man, the, the air quality on my block is really bad, so I'm going to take my kids to the park across town where the air quality is better. Right now, you can't do that with any kind of data that we have. Yeah. You know, I wanted to mention that um, you, you were talking about sort of the area of concern, the 200 meters or so. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, in this series on our website um, is a map uh, that was actually created by Kevin Lane at Boston University, who's doing this kind of research as well, that sort of shows the, uh, the area around the highways that uh, is sort of the area of highest concern. Of course, this, as we s you said, th this, this kind of pollution is, is widespread around the city, but it, it's a much higher concentrations in within a, a certain distance of uh, of the highways and uh, on the series uh, page on wgbhnews.org you can find in the first of the stories uh, um, an interactive map where you can see if you know you're close to a roadway are you within that uh, that danger zone or not um, you know we have a question from the audience actually that I'd like to, to, to get to and also I I've neglected to mention that if people are watching on Facebook live if you do have questions uh, for our scientist guests um, please feel free to, to write them in there and and we'll try to get them as well uh, this question is sort of a a broad one, so um, uh, we'll do our best to address it, but it, it's in what other ways are people of color affected disproportionately by environmental issues? That's a huge question, and I think there's a number of ways uh, that they are affected, um, but is, would any of you like to take a crack at that? You know, other ways in terms of your own research that you've seen uh, that um, maybe people are of color are disproportionately affected? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the roadways going through uh, communities of color, low-income communities of color, is a, is a major uh, component that we see. Uh, we see it in Boston. We see it nationwide. Yep. Uh, Flint, Michigan is a great example of a community of color that is disproportionately impacted by an environmental problem where there was uh, really poor management of the water system, the municipal water system that exposed that entire community to, to lead. Um, so uh, any poorly um, you know, managed industrial site or hazardous waste sites can have depressed property values near it. Mm -hmm. And um, that will um, you know, uh, um, mean the people who live there um, or have to live there because they can't afford more expensive neighborhoods are going to be disproportionately Im impacted by that. Yeah. Yeah, by that reality. Unfortunately, there are, there's no shortage of examples of, of this issue generally, 
uh, environmental justice issues um, that we could talk about. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to focus on the, the ultrafine particles for now because uh, we've got a lot to talk about there. But, but I think, I mean, that's yeah. a, it's a, I think it's a great question because, you know, it really makes you think about, you know, who's exposed to what and, and where do they live and, yeah. and what do they know about it. And um, one of the interesting things about our work is that um, we're, we, you know, the, um, the the governing idea is that you know that most people who live in in disproportionately um, lo low income areas are going to be more largely impacted by by transportation related pollution or or, or um, pollution in, in general. But because of um, you know just the, the the needs to develop in in areas where we haven't currently done a lot of development work where you find um, low income or low uh, property values, um, there's pressure to put in um, uh, properties that are more expensive. So it's not just low income people who are going to be exposed under these circumstances. So in Boston, there's pressure to put in high income, high, high rent, high um, price condos near busy roadways, to your near other transportation corridors. I think so nationwide, this idea of transit-oriented. Equally exposed in all income brackets. Yeah, transit-oriented uh, kind of residential living, which, of course, everybody wants to cut down their commute time, right? Yeah. <laughs> People are pushing closer and closer to transportation hubs, which I think is overall it's a good idea if it encourages public transportation. And I think it has potential uh, to lead to other good effects, like John was mentioning. Once people start demanding better air quality in those buildings, then we start doing research and we start coming up with options. And I think with developers, I think it's just a matter of knowing what to put in, people asking for it, and there being good science to back it up. Right. You know, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, one of the things, though, that we see is uh, with these newer buildings that are going up, especially if they are uh, more, you know, higher income buildings that are that are in some of these communities. Um, a lot of the developers are including things like air filtration and HVAC systems that filter out ultrafine particles. Uh, but the lower income buildings that already exist there oftentimes don't include that, right? I mean, so I, I wanted to kind of ask you about that. What do we see? We, we're not just experiencing this stuff when we walk around on the street near the highways. What are we experiencing inside of our homes, in our buildings, in our schools, and things like that? How much of the stuff is getting inside? And actually, can you can you sort of address that? I think our research indicates that around seventy percent of the particles that we measure outside make it indoors. But each about seven. I want to repeat that. That's a keep. About seventy percent of the particles you measure outside are actually making it indoors as well. Yes. That's a key but point. I want to make. Uh, but each house is different. Yeah. Okay. For some houses, it could be as much as 100%. For some houses, it could be just 20%. And, and, and what are the differences? Wh how, how do we, how, what, what, why do some homes have more of this than others? If you have an older, leakier home with a lot more air that's outside coming inside, then you've got a higher fraction of particles making it indoors. Mm -hmm. uh, if you keep your windows open a lot, that brings in more air. So it's just basically all about how you're balancing out the flows in your home. If you're bringing, it more, bringing in more outside air, you're bringing in more particles with it. Yeah. On the other hand, you do need to ventilate your home. Right. And need to know when to open the windows. Yeah, we have this idea, I think, that when you open the windows to your home, you're letting in fresh air, right? I like to open in the wi windows of my place and, and let fresh air in, but it, depending on what community you're in, you're not necessarily doing that. Right, so it's fresh, and there's a difference between fresh and clean. The idea of fresh and stale is so embedded in the indoor air literature that we stale air is the indoor air, mm -hmm. and you open the, win air, open the windows, you get fresh air in. Right, but fresh and clean are different. That's a really great point. You know, one of the uh, places that we focused on in the series uh, is not just homes, but schools. Uh, an area that I think all of your research has, has po pointed to as being one of the worst places for this kind of pollution is Chinatown. Uh, that there is a, a, a confluence of, of highways there and it's a low income community that is full of ultrafine particles. There, is, uh, there are a number of schools in Chinatown built immediately on the pike, uh, including the Josiah Quincy Upper School, which I learned has no HVAC system, no centralized HVAC system. And the headmaster of the school told me when it gets warm out, what they do is they open up the windows and let in air. And that there's no remediation whatsoever 
for the air pollution that's coming in when they do that. Um, is that, is, is, <laughs> John, is that a concern? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, there's, a, there's a good body of science which, which indicates uh, that you really ought to be cleaning that air, you know, ought to be filtering it uh, significantly before it's being um, you know, uh, introduced into the breathing environment for people in the school. They've probably got other issues they're, they're worrying about. You know, heat dissipation is a, is a big problem. O often people will, will open their windows just to let the heat out if it's overheated. Of often with older buildings, um, there's not, usually what people will do is, uh, you know, make sure that the occupants are warm to the, to the extent that they're simply too warm and the only way to regulate temperature is to open up the window. And when you do that, then of course outdoor air pollution comes in. So it's a, it's a trade-off and so, you know, that, that trade-off needs to be exposed. People need to understand it and make decisions accordingly. Yeah. And, and no, pollution's, pollution's always coming in. Yeah. Uh, it's just a question of how much of it is coming in. Right, you're letting in a lot more when you open the windows. Yeah, yeah. and right. if, it, if it's coming in, then you, you need to remove it. And it turns out we have great ways to remove particulate matter once it gets indoors. Uh, HEPA filters are a great way to do that. And to we ran a pilot program at the Dante Alighieri School in East Boston uh, about six months ago, put a HEPA filter in every single classroom and reduce the particle concentrations by over 70%. It's not that expensive to do, to put one of these filters in every classroom, but then you, you also need to do things like weigh how much are the windows open. Yeah. Uh, can, right. can you put some passive barriers in those windows to prevent some of the particles from coming in? Helps a little bit, uh, but not a whole lot. So there's, there's bigger sort of environmental temperature regulation things that pair in with the air quality. Sure. So you, you mentioned HEPA filters, and I, want, I really want to get to what this is. I think people uh, need to know uh, what some of the things that they could do, maybe in their own home, to, to address this. Uh, no, actually, can you, you've done a lot of research on HEPA filters and how effective they are. T tell us about what they are and, and, and what you found. Well, single pass efficiency is over 99%. So if I take this parcel of air and I pass it through the HEPA filter, it's supposed to cut down particulate pollution by 99%. And there are nuances to it, but they're really good at doing their job. So these are like a freestanding thing. You put it in your room, you plug it in, you turn it on, and, and it's filtering the air. Right, but then you've got this whole big parcel of air in your room, mm -hmm. and all of it needs to get cycled through the HIPAA filter to get cleaned up. So now it gets into like knowing the right capacity for your room. Right, right. How big is the room makes a difference. If you're talking about a, a giant classroom versus a, a small bedroom, maybe right. there's a difference in terms of how big of a filter you need. And then the third new answer is like, all right, this air is not stagnant in the room, right? It's changing over what you're bringing in from outdoors, indoors, or are you creating more sources indoors? And I think we want to touch on indoor sources of ultrafine particles too, because I think that's an important issue. But going back to the HEPA, they're really good at doing their job, but we need to know what the right capacity is for the room, yeah. and then we need to remember to turn them on. There are studies that have investigated uh, filter interventions, and there are real barriers to that. Mm -hmm. People are given filters, but there are reasons as to why they turn them on or they don't turn them on. Yeah, they got to be on to work. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and the filters have to be maintained and replaced yep. periodically, otherwise they lose their, their ability to remove the... The, the small particles. Yeah, actually, somebody that I spoke to in the in the series uh, was living in uh, an apartment that had air filtration, but they ha the filters hadn't been changed. Right. And and Big it's problem. important to actually maintain that and actually keep up with it. Which actually gets me to a, a great question from the audience, um, which is, uh, what can the government do to protect residents of low income housing? Mm. Um, and uh, one of the studies that was done um, by Gary Demkowitz at Harvard compared uh, older units in the old colony. Uh, housing complex in uh, in South Boston to newer redevelopment of this, the same uh, housing complex and found that you know interventions like you know not letting them designing the windows so they don't open up very wide onto the outside and having central air um, uh, can really actually reduce that kind of filtration right I mean is, is this what you've seen is are there other things that um, that public housing uh, can be protected from from this uh, this sort of impact yeah, I think with, with better regulations about uh, what are the requirements for developers uh, that are putting in new, uh, new development close to roadways, close to airports, uh, that we know the things that can make a healthier indoor environment with uh, regard to particulate matter. Um, so having tighter standards for that is... 
it's really important. I mean, to to I that think, point, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, you know, I think there's a role for, for greater awareness, which I think is a great reason why your series exists and why we're having this forum today is, is to, um, you know, shed some light on, on the, the need for greater awareness of, of environmental exposures to these kinds of, of pollutants. So it's ultrafine particles, but there are other components of transportation pollution that we should, you know, we should acknowledge, you know, it's carbon monoxide. Nitrogen oxides, black carbon—they're all—they're all there. Ultrafine particles are our interest today because they're right, they're relatively unstudied, and they're everywhere, and their toxicity is 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 acute, chronic, and needs to be studied. But I think you know, for the messages that I would like to impart um, to the listeners is that you know things can be can be done. We have enough science, we have enough en engineering smarts to know how to reduce exposures. So I think for people who are living in, in public housing. Um, the you know the keys are to um, have some control over your heat so that you're n you do not have to open the windows to let the heat out mm -hmm. and keep your apartment cool, to kind of know what times of the day, what times of your pollution levels are at their worst. So if you're trying to reduce your exposure to, to outdoor air pollution that might be coming to your unit, you want you nearly need to know what time of year, what time of day pollution levels are at the highest. Just the, as mm -hmm. Scott was saying with, with the exercise. And then, you know, if, if, if people have any kind of, um, you know, or organizational unit within their buildings, and they can, they can um, um, motivate management to invest money into central air handling systems, that would be the way to go. Because then you can install a single set of HEPA filters um, in the rooftop that's filtering in the outdoor air. You can have um, units, um, filters in each individual unit. And those can be easily swapped out and replaced when they get full. And for, you know, relatively... Um, inexpensive investments or lo relatively low cost investments you can make I mean, huge impacts in, in people's uh, air, air quality yeah the, to that point the, the Boston Public Schools told me about the Josiah Quincy school that uh, in the uh, the upper school where there's no HVAC system uh, they couldn't really put in a, a system-wide uh, filtration without having an HVAC system, and that individual HEPA filters into individual classrooms would not really be an effective answer. I mean, does, does, that, does that seem, well actually, do you think uh, right, or is there something that they could do in those schools to impact the kind of exposure the students and the, and the teachers are having? Well, maybe they were trying to say that the rooms are too huge and they'll have to bring in a whole lot of standalone HEPA filter units. And if their building is leaky and kids like open windows and fresh air, then you could put in a lot of people units, but they're just overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they're ineffective, in which case this is not a good intervention. Maybe it's not worth it for the school. And maybe putting in an air mechanical handling system, which is a good intervention because you have somewhat, the more control you have over the air, better it is when right. you're trying to come up with. Uh, and they are rebuilding that school. And I, I did speak to the, uh, to the uh, people who were uh, building it or designing it, and they said they want to have uh, very state-of-the-art filtration. But that's just the upper school. There's also a lower school that has an HVAC system, but it does not have this kind of filtration. Is, is it possible to put filtration into existing HVAC systems that would actually address this? I think this is more a question for our mechanical engineers. Okay, okay. all right, <laughs> great. great. Yes. Y yes, it can be done. It can, yes, be, done. can be done. And yeah. Scott, to your point about um, uh, the, the, the sort of broader interventions and, and trying to actually prevent this kind of construction from, from happening without these sort of interventions, there, there are a number of bills that have been introduced here in Massachusetts. Uh, Representative Denise Provo in particular has introduced a number of them that would actually say that new uh, developers of new uh, homes and buildings along the highways should basically take this into account. Do you think that kind of legislation would make a difference in this? Yeah, I think that definitely makes a difference. Yeah. And, and I want to add to the, the school conversation, too. I mean, we, we did this intervention in Dante Alighieri School. Those are big classrooms, and they open their windows. Yeah. Um, and even when the windows are open, so we actually had this awesome class of fourth graders that recorded for three weeks every time they opened the window. Huh. So I have those data, and even when the window is open to let some heat out, uh, the HEPA filter keeps up and still shows over a 60% reduction in ultrafine particle concentrations. And these are, these are pretty big classrooms with a single filter. So, you know, I think uh, there's promise there uh, for doing that type of work. And obviously we need to understand every different environment is going to have different characteristics and you need to have a tailored kind of HEPA filter intervention to, to work in different types of environments, but it, it can be done. One important point that we haven't really gotten to yet is that it's not just cars that are creating this kind of pollution. Airplanes burn fuel too. And uh, you've all done research around Logan Airport. Um, what 
have you found around Logan Airport? No, no actually, let's start with you. I mean, wh what have you seen around Logan Airport in terms of this kind of pollution? So to give you a sense of the fuel they burn, I think last time we checked in 2013, around 100 million kilograms of jet A fuel was burnt at Logan mm -hmm. in the first 900 meters of the operation cycle of the planes. That's about 26% of all the cars in Boston. Wow. Per year. Wow. So when we're looking at our transportation infrastructures in big cities, be it Los Angeles, be it Boston, um, there's somewhat of an under recognition of things other than highways and cars and their contribution towards air pollution. 26% mm -hmm. um, is not a small number. No, it's not. No, it's not. And Scott, you've got monitors, uh, little uh, kind of devices that are measuring this kind of pollution in people's backyards all around the communities around Logan. We do, yeah, and uh, uh, John will actually both have their own sets of instruments out there as well. So yeah. th there's a lot of work going to understand the dynamics around Logan, and and the the issue with Logan, and and they'll actually did some great work to show how Logan, there's a lot of emissions sort of on the ground that acts as a source, and downwind of that, you experience it miles away, uh, and those particles get indoors, and, and you should share more about that. But in addition to that increase in sort of the background pollution that you experience downwind, there's these acute curtains of particles that get dropped by every single aircraft that lands or takes off over the community. Uh, so John was talking about the, the on-road concentration of particles being 50,000 per cubic centimeter. When an aircraft lands over the top of you, it's often 500,000 per cubic centimeters. So I mean, these are concentrations that are far higher than even standing in the middle of a congested Highway 93. And Logan Airport, unlike, you know, you go to some other cities in the airport, you got to drive an hour to get to the airport, right? Logan Airport's right here in, you know, uh, our community. It, and it's surrounded yeah. by residential areas. Yep. What, I mean, You've got these highways in the sky. It's essentially no yeah. difference. And except for the cars on those highways in the sky are much bigger yeah. and burn a lot more fuel. Right. What were the numbers, uh, John? The 750 gallons <laughs> fuel per hour is uh, burned by each of the, the jet planes, the big jets. Yeah. And then uh, cars, by contrast, is about a gallon per hour. So should, the speed. should the people, first uh, and foremost, for the people living immediately around Logan Airport, should they be concerned about their exposure to this? Absolutely, yeah. And it, it depends a lot on where you are around the airport and whether you happen to be under one of these flight paths. That makes a big difference. Uh, and also whether you're upwind or downwind. Uh, so, d you know, if you are to the west of the airport and we predominantly have westerly winds, it's mostly blowing it away from you for the better part of the year. Uh, I've uh, community contacts and people that we work with in, in Jeffrey's Point in East Boston. So that's just to the west of the airport, uh, stone's throw from Terminal A. And a lot of the time they, they don't notice the airport pollution, but if it's foggy, uh, if there's one of these stable atmospheric conditions like John was talking about, or if there's a slight easterly wind, uh, they have to leave their homes because of the smell of jet fuel. Uh, they can't go outside, that jet fuel smell gets inside. And the reason is that uh, Terminal A, there's, there's aircraft that are lined up right there, and when they're, dis when they're gonna go right take right. off, mm -hmm. they, they cold start their engines, and that's the least efficient operation of a jet engine is at low thrust, below 4%. Uh, so there's just enormous amounts of emissions that happen right there at the terminal that make their way right into Jeffrey's Point. And so there's, there's corollaries to that story all over East Boston and Winthrop, it, but your exposure might be different. So I, I have uh, people that I work with in Winthrop, in the part of Winthrop that's colloquially known as the maze. So it's right next to uh, the 22L landing mm -hmm. runway. Mm -hmm. and they mostly complain about the smell of burned rubber. The reason for that is that there's westerly winds and when jets land on the runway, you see this big cloud of, of rubber smoke yeah. and it advects directly into their neighborhood. So, you know, you, this is the stuff that, this is the reason that there's so many sensors around East Boston and Winthrop is we're trying to understand these dynamics and understand sort of the fingerprints of, you know, what's the, what's the wind, 
what's the runway activity and how does that correspond to different concentrations of different pollutants? I went to Logan for the story. I talked to the people at Massport um, and uh, they told me, actually uh, before that I actually went to Winthrop and, and spoke to someone who has one of your monitors in her backyard. And she was concerned in particular about the expansion of Logan Airport, that there is an expansion process that's happening right now. They're building a whole new Terminal E. When I went to Logan and talked to them about this, they said, you know, number one, they actually acknowledged that ultrafine particles is something that they're concerned about and they're looking at and, they, and they're in support of all of your research. But secondly, they said, actually, the expansion of the, the terminals is going to reduce the amount of air pollution because if we have more gates available, there's going to be fewer planes just sitting on the runway, running their engines, idling as they wait for a gate to pull into. Um, and that, uh, and they also talked about electrifying the ground crew equipment, uh, which which they acknowledged is, is actually a, s a small part of the airport's emissions, but but it's it's a step in the, in the right direction. Uh, they said, um, will those sorts of things uh, address some of this, um, and is it enough? I mean, that's at least a great start. Yeah, congestion delays have been studied a lot, yeah. and if we can reduce emissions, if we can cut down on how much fuel we burned, then yes, we are creating less pollution because this is just respecting the basic laws of physics, right? You burn less fuel, you end up with less combustion yeah. products. So great start right there. Yeah, so I it's, a, it's a yes and thing, right? So if, if, uh, if there's fewer aircraft idling on a runway, waiting for a gate or waiting to take off and they can stay at the gate with their engines off for a longer period of time. Yeah, there's that's less, that's less that's emissions. If you electrify the, uh, the, ground, the ground vehicles, that's gonna have a huge impact. Yeah. So, but, uh, but again, we're talking about the neighborhoods immediately right. it, it, right. around Logan that are impacted, that, but, but as your research, uh, and, and you, you, you touched on this before, shows we're the impact isn't just for the neighboring homes, is it? Not at all. And not depends on how big the airport is and what the wind distribution around the airport is. Which runways are active? Which runways are active. Yeah. Uh, but you can have impact zones that we know stretch at least 10 kilometers in Boston. Yeah, six miles, yeah. Six miles. Yeah. And then you've got something like 18 or 20 kilometers in Los Angeles, 22 kilometers in London. Uh, Amsterdam. Is that because when you watch a plane land at Logan Airport, oh yes. it's low for a while? Yeah. It's that the landing jets have a huge impact on ground level impacts on air pollution that we observe. Because planes, when they take off, they take off really quickly and they do burn a lot of fuel. Takeoff burns a lot of fuel. But they're up in the sky faster because their angle of, of yeah. um, the, you know, right. Right. relative to the wind is much more acute. So, what could be done about the, for the homes around uh, Logan and, and further out that do have exposure to this kind of pollution. I mean, we're going to have planes, right? There's nothing we can do about that. We need planes flying in and out of Logan. It's going to happen. Uh, we've all taken them. Uh, so what can we do to reduce the exposure to this kind of pollution uh, in, in the homes and schools uh, around Logan? I, th I think there's two things that are low-hanging fruit. Uh, one is to equip those communities with higher spatial resolution data so that they know what the pollution is like on their block and not five miles away in downtown Boston. Uh, people can use those data to decide what their out outdoor activity looks like and reduce their exposure. Even do things like uh, get a push alert that says uh, the air quality in your block is really bad. Maybe you should close your windows. Uh, so uh, data uh, and democratized data is, is one really important thing. I think the other thing is HEPA filters in these homes that are impacted. Uh, we know that they're really effective at removing the particles when they do get in. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive in comparison to mitigation efforts like soundproofing that Massport has, uh, Massport and the FAA have invested in. Uh, and that would make a real difference in the exposure of people who live in those areas close to the airport. Yeah, the, the Massport's comment about that was that um, they, they want to see your research inform a national discussion about how we deal with aviation-related air pollution. And then from that point, we can, uh, you know, it, once the FAA comes up with guidance and a policy on dealing with this, that they'd be, you know, so in support of, of whatever it comes from that. Um, and that's, that's great if, if the regulatory lever gets pulled and it forces that to happen nationwide. I think uh, my perspective is, is Mathport currently has mitigation efforts in the East Boston and one third communities. Uh, this could be a mitigation for effort. For sound. Yeah, for sound. They also do other community investment things. They pay for parades and flowers in the park. Um, perhaps some of that flower money could go towards HEPA filters instead of uh, parks. If uh, people want to buy their own 
HEPA filters. If people are, you know, realizing they're in either, you know, a, a landing path of, of Logan or they're right next to, uh, you know, 93 or the Pike, um, you know, what, sh what should they do in terms of trying to figure out how to mitigate this in their own homes? I mean, not just there. I live in Arlington. Mm -hmm. I still turn on my HEPA filter. Okay. Cleaner air is always better to breathe. Right? Are these things expensive? You can get anything from like a few hundred dollars to really expensive units. I think uh, they get more expensive if you want them to make less noise. Mm -hmm. If you want very gentle drafts out of the machine. You can buy window mounted ones that will act as an air conditioner. As well as. And a heater, so yeah. those cost several thousand. But you get little standalone towers that are actually you know, quite attractive and innocuous, and they, they might cost you know, less than $200. Okay. Yeah. But, they're not, but they're not pulling a lot of air. Yeah. Right. So you need to close your bedroom doors, close the windows. If you really want to create a safe breathing environment for eight hours of the time that you're in your bedroom, that's what you need to do. Yeah. And y y I mean, the first thing you need to s is spec your environment. Like, how, how big are the rooms that you want to filter? How many of the rooms do you want to filter? And then you need to find an appropriate filter. Uh, the ones that we use in our uh, filter intervention work are Austin Air filters. They have a pretty good flow rate. They're really effective at removing particles, and they're easy to operate and fairly quiet. Uh, we're running a, an in-home and in-school filter subsidy pilot right now. Uh, so our research group at Olin, the Air Partners Research Group, uh, is scaling that to 50 homes over the next year. Uh, so if folks are interested, uh, we have free HEPA filters to give to people in East Boston uh, if they want to sign up on our website, airpartners.org. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, you know, Massport says we, we like to see your data. Uh, and we like to have this inform a national effort. Uh, we're actively in the process of understanding airport dynamics and their impact on ambient air quality. We're also working on how can we roll out a subsidy program for filters that airproof uh, people's homes in those environments. I'm glad you mentioned uh, that that program in East Boston where people actually might be able to, if you if they're watching this or in their audience, uh, you know, sign up to to potentially get one of those. If, if there are others out there who are concerned about this and they'd like to learn more about what they can do to, to find out just how much they're exposed and what they can do about it, are there resources that you would, that you would point people to? Um, our our c combined group has a, a website. It's uh, the CAFE website, C-A-F-E-H, mm -hmm. um, at, at Tufts, and there's a lot of guidance there. All of our papers that we've written uh, all the projects we've been involved with over the years are described there in in um, friendly language, not 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 science and engineering. Yeah. And there are um, a number of different measures that people can can uh, take depending on where they live and how close to the highways they are, how close to the airports they are. So that's a that's a place to start. Scott, are there other resources that you would? Uh, I mean, you mentioned your own site. Yeah. So airpartners.org. We have some. Uh, uh, low-hanging fruit things that folks can do uh, to reduce their exposure. Uh, ultimately, uh, there aren't a lot of great resources out there. Uh, so I, I had a student team <laughs> that's spent probably a cumulative 30 hours scouring the internet for guidance on what to do to reduce your exposure to pollution. And they made this beautiful pie chart that had 97% was air pollution is bad, it will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and then a tiny sliver of one resource that was uh, sort of helpful, but maybe not very accessible language. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's something that we're co we collectively need to work on as the science and engineering community is how do we communicate more effectively, and how can better distributed data inform some of the some of the things that people can really do. Right. You know, I, j lastly, uh, I, I like this one question we got on our Facebook page uh, from Tom. He says, air pollution is an important topic. Should it be more important in our politics? Uh, I, I, th I think uh, I'm guessing the answer is, is yes here. But what, what, do, what, do you think about <laughs> what do you think about whether or not this should uh, play a, a larger role in our, our political discussions? I'm not the most objective person to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of you probably are. But you know, let's have it. Um, Can we just say yes? <laughs> yes, yeah, I think it, it, it speaks to the culture. I mean, I like this phrase that I. Uh, picked up from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, like a culture of health, right? Yeah. Public health should be an important topic in our politics. Air pollution is part of that. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, w we've demonstrated over the years that, that the regulatory levers are effective 
at safeguarding people's health. You know, the first Clean Air Act in the 1970s uh, did a lot to reduce the amount of pollution in heavily polluted areas like Los Angeles. Uh, regulation works for this. Uh, we currently are in a phase nationally scary times of weakening all of those yeah, regulatory very, very safeguards. Um, and that should absolutely be a part of the decisions that people make for who they, who they vote for and what types of bills they support uh, and the way that they contact their legislators to push things like better regulation for, for particles or brand new legis legislation for uh, ultrafines. I, you know, I think an uh, uh, important thing to realize is that we have some of the best air quality in, in the world. One of the reasons why we're studying ultrafine particles in the Boston area is because a lot of the other pollution problems have been addressed. And so once you sort of, the, the skies kind of clear up a little bit, you can say, okay, look, what else, what else is there to worry about? Mm -hmm. and, and, and lo and behold, there are tons of ultrafine particles that no one's ever even studied before. So now we're sort of you know, on, the, on the wave of that. Um, I don't know, I think, Greenhouse gases are hugely important. Um, maybe um, they kind of dwarf the entire conversation around you know, right. the impacts of, of, of um, you know, transportation-related um, uh, air pollution, and that should be part of the conversation. Um, uh, you know, absolutely. And so the, the I think we live in, I mean, we actually pay a ton for our clean air, if you think about it. Every time you buy a new car, you're paying for the catalytic converter, and it costs several thousand dollars. The, um, the PM2.5 standards for, um, uh, the U.S. are some of the most expensive environmental regulations ever enacted. We're paying you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars every year um, to keep our skies um, relatively clean of PM 2.5, as well as the other pollution that's, that's coming out of you know, coal combustion and oil combustion emissions that are used to produce electricity. So we're already paying a lot, but we're not paying enough. We're not controlling CO2. We're not controlling methane. And so we have you know, uh, global warming to, you know, to pay for uh, in many ways. And so, um, yes, to answer um, Tom's excellent question, it should be um, definitely more part of the national political discussion. And, and the core yes. of both of those problems is, is fuel combustion. Right. right, so I was gonna say that at some point in time, we all have to like start taking collective responsibility for living in this society that's a very mobile society. Mm -hmm. And we need our cars and airplanes. Like, can we be a little more conscientious about how we travel, because that is definitely something we can all do. I mean, there are politics to that too, yeah. at, at a level that yeah. we are in charge. Uh, there's an attainable future of electric vehicles that are powered mostly by renewable energy. There's a future in which that's attainable. Uh, unclear whether th how that applies to aircraft. I was going to say electric planes yeah. may, may be uh, a few more years down the line, but right. uh, maybe we'll get there. So so in the meantime, you know, we, we need to do what we can to reduce our exposure. And, and I think the, the uh, John mentioned this, that it's really important that we don't accentuate a culture of disempowered fear that already exists, right? So uh, yeah, there are ultrafine particles everywhere. If you live near the airport, if you live near a roadway, your exposure is going to be higher. And also, there are things that you can do to reduce your exposure. And, and there's a lot of work going on to understand where are those heavily impacted areas and, and what can you do about it. Um, but in the meantime, there, there are things that you can do. Well, it's, it's an important topic. I think it's one that's not talked ab about very much. And, and that's why I'm so grateful to all of you for sharing your work, both in the, in the three-part series that's on WGBHnews.org uh, and here today, thank you for coming and speaking with us all today uh, on this just crucially important topic that I think is just a little, little understood and hopefully will be more understood uh, going forward. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, John Durant and Alexi Hutta of Tufts University and Scott, uh, Scott Hersey of the Olin College of Engineering. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah, thanks thank for you. doing this series. It's, it's really important. I mean, we all mentioned that this lack of awareness is a big problem problem with ultrafine particles. So, you know, you doing your part to do this story and this series to, to help raise awareness is like, this is really important work. Great, thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, thank this you, is uh, the first, I think, in a series of uh, Wednesday lunchtime conversations on different news topics here at the, uh, the studios at the Boston Public Library uh, here on Facebook Live. So join us every Wednesday and Thursday for conversations like this one and other topics. We really appreciate your being here and joining us today. Thanks so much. <laughs>